Hello everyone, Marty Braden here. To those of you who are new to my channel, I want to welcome you. I hope you find my content in this video helpful and worth your precious time. Today's video was inspired by a new friend of mine, a friendship that started when I read a comment he had made in one of my video's comment strings. His name is Harlan, and he's not the Harlan I did a Zoom call with a while ago. This is another Harlan who's a member of the Catholic Church. I decided to take our conversation offline using email so our friendship could grow as we had several back and forth exchanges over the last couple of months. Besides Harlan's full-time work, he has devoted a considerable amount of his spare time to Catholic apologetics. Harlan was an evangelical early on in his life, and then for a variety of reasons and through a series of experiences, he converted to Catholicism. I mentioned Harlan's brief story to help set the table for the topic I'm going to talk about on this video. I felt it fits very well within the series of videos I'm doing titled Dispelling the Accusatory Fog. And that's because Harlan is a perfect example of the kind of person that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints often encounter. Harlan and I have been cordial towards each other as we've worked together to try and find what I call the third option, which is an option other than uh, my view against your opposing view, where we're at odds with each other's beliefs, which is, um, if we're not careful, it can cause a disconnect, it can cause discord, and possibly even hurt feelings. So I told Harlan there's another option, which, as I said, is the third option. It consists of a foundation made up of ideas and beliefs that we agree on. They are all of the A's from our set of the table kind of discussions. The illustration you see helps uh, set the table visually so that I can now serve the meat and potatoes and talk about the D's or those things Harlan and I disagree on and that remain outside of the third option's foundation foundation upon which we stand together. That said, I'm now going to focus on those D's we have against each other, I suppose, because I think it's the D's that many, if not most members of the church are you know, discomforted and set aback by. So members are often fearful of being confronted with all of the D's that our critics constantly hurl at us. And yes, although Harlan is now a friend, he's also a critic of the church and of my beliefs and its doctrines. It's my belief that as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ and a believer in the restored church of Jesus Christ, I should be Christ-like and friendly towards our critics and even our enemies. In fact, I believe we should follow what Jesus said in terms of how we should go about this. Here's what Jesus said about it. It's found in the book of John, chapter 13. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And later in verse 34 through 35, he said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also have loved one to another. And by this, showing forth a Christ-like love towards each other, all men shall know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. In other words, we are the fruit on the tree of Jesus' gospel. We are the fruit that all searching uh, fruit inspectors should see and taste. A modern-day apostle, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, who is the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles right now, said this. And I quote, I say to all that if you haven't already, you will one day find yourself called to defend your faith simply because you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I say to you, defend your faith with courtesy <clears throat> and with compassion, but defend it. This is a good time to share the heart and theme of this video. It's one of my favorite quotes ever stated by a believer of Jesus Christ. His name is Austin Farrar, an English Anglican philosopher, theologian, and biblical scholar. Here's what he said, and I quote, What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish, end quote. I hope that what I'm going to share with you now will help all of us in our effort to follow the counsel of Elder Holland as we try to defend the church and its truth claims with courtesy and compassion, and still act and speak in such a way that we contribute to the maintenance of the climate necessary for belief to flourish. I recently watched a live stream uh, done by Cardin Ellis of Ward Radio. He had a special guest on his show recently. His name was Austin Fife, who wrote a new book titled Light and Truth Letter, 
which is a response to the CES letter that contains most of the recycled criticisms of the church and its truth claims. I invited Austin to be a special guest on my channel, and he accepted to do it after he gets back from traveling overseas. It'll be for the early part of October, so watch for that. It's going to be fun. Anyway, Cardin said a few things on the topic of defend our faith that I want to share with you. I recognize and understand Cardin's heart. He has a fun and playful personality. The man is quite a talent, that's for sure. But I must also say that I'm very different than Cardin when it comes to his defending the faith approach. If you have gone into any of the comment strings for any of my videos of late, you will find my way of defending the church and its truth claims throughout each comment string. That said, let me share a few comments that Cardin made on his live stream that was titled, The CES Letter Just Got Destroyed, But Who Wrote the Light and the Truth Letter Rebuttal? Cardin said, The information our critics give is not the problem. The real issue is their interpretation of the information. Let me interject a comment here. I said this very same thing in my book, An Atheist Delusion. It's a fact that it comes down to interpretations from both sides of the debate. For both sides have the same information and data, but see it very differently. Anyway, Cardin continues. Critics try to convince their listeners that they only share what the church leadership did not want us to know. However, when you examine their statements carefully, you will realize that most everything new that the critics share is ultimately innocuous or came from the church's sources themselves. Ultimately, the manipulation happens in the presentation of data in history and not in the data in history itself. In other words, they try to poison the well. This isn't doubt, it's manipulation with the prophet, Cardin says, and everybody else from Scripture Central to every other Tom, Dick, and Harry podcast having to do with LDS apologetics, except for Fair, um, Cardin says, who have been um, showing their spine, but nobody else seems to have the spine to say, no, no, hold on. Critics like Dan, excuse me, Cardin, and other anti-Mormon critics are uh, profiting off people in a faith crisis, and they're making tens of thousands of dollars doing it. Mr. Fife's wife then said, the CES letter, as just one example, tries to make you feel like an idiot. They want you to ask yourself, if all this stuff the critics are saying is true, then I'm an idiot for believing otherwise. But the light and truth letter steps into the mix and makes a space for belief, or what Austin Farrar called a climate wherein one's belief can flourish through education. Cardin continues, apologists are bending over backwards to become friends with people that hate us for no good reason other than the secret um, they secretly think in the back of their critical minds. Academia has the real truth. Austin Fife then says that this book is not the ultimate source of light and truth. It's just something that gives folks that space to seek the ultimate source of light and truth, who is Jesus Christ and the gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cardin then says, the truth of the matter is that you weren't lied to by the church. You were lied to by the people who said you were lied to by the church. We have to understand that we are in a war, Cardin says, a war that is the continuation of the war that started in heaven, but it's now raging here on earth. Cardin says we must understand that the battlefield has been upgraded so that we're having to use spiritual tanks and other spiritual upgraded weapons of war now. We're in a state of war and are fighting on the battlefield of ideas and ideologies. The two ideologies are the two churches spoken of by Nephi, in other words. There's a great two-part video series called We Will Witness What Nephi Saw in Vision, and it's part one and two. Watch it. Continuing, except one side, Cardin says, is refusing to admit it, and there are those who are supposed to be protecting us from what is happening now. We need to step up and become the adult in the room. I'll let you take Cardin's comments here as you want and make them mean to whatever you want to make them mean for you. I'm going to take what the Lord himself counseled us to do, as well as what Elder Holland counseled us to do, and that was to defend it, but do it with courtesy and compassion, and it is my belief that being kind and making friends with some of our critics is in fact possible. Harlan and other critics that I've come uh, quite acquainted with since starting my channel are just such examples. That said, I want to share what Harlan has said directly to me in several emails that he sent me. And then I'll share what I have chosen to make them mean to me. These won't be in any particular order. They're just some of the direct, dogmatic comments he's made in his correspondence with me. Harlan starts out with, 
You ventured out into public view on the internet voluntarily, Marty. This is the forum you chose. You will have to deal with the counter apologetics of many different kinds of content creators like Trent Horn, James White, Brian Mercier, uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall, and now me, Harlan. <laughs> Marty, as Ben Shapiro has said, he said, facts don't care about your feelings. Your exegesis of scripture is incorrect, Marty. Exegesis is any critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially of scripture. So my interpretation of scripture is incorrect, as far as Harlan says. What's worse is your decision to err with postmodern philosophy in a religious way. For those who don't know what postmodern philosophy is, it is defined as a philosophical movement that emerged in the second half of the 20th century as a critique of modernist ideas. It's characterized by a general skepticism and suspicion of reason and a rejection of concepts like objectivity and rationality and universal truth, in other words, academia. So are you beginning to see that Harlan is a true academic in his thinking and his mindset, religiously speaking? I have to tell you that I like Harlan and truly appreciate the years of study and academics he has invested in himself throughout his life. To me, Harlan reminds me of the scripture that says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is my opinion, of course, but I see Harlan's faith as being based on academia, tradition, and supernatural signs, as on the day of Pentecost in Acts. That's from the Catholic Catechism. Evangelicals and Catholics agree on the objective nature of divine revelation, and feelings have no bearing on truth or revelation. I have to say there, there's uh, not enough time to go into the plethora of examples where feelings of the heart were evident throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament, but let me continue with more comments made by Harlan that helps you see that what I said earlier about interpretations are at the heart of the academic religious mindset. Harlan continues saying, Catholics disagree on the sources of revelation and authority in the church. Evangelicals go for sola scriptura, and Catholics go for scripture, tradition, and magisterium. The term magisterium has multiple meanings, including the teachings authority of the Catholic Church, all the way to a children's fantasy series. The magisterium, in terms of the Catholic definition is concerned, is the authority of the Catholic Church to interpret the word of God, both in writing and through tradition. The magisterium is made up of the Pope and the bishops who teach in union with him. The magisterium's authority comes from Christ and its guidance from the Holy Spirit. I haven't yet asked Harlan to describe for me what he means by guidance from the Holy Spirit and how one receives that guidance, but it sounds a lot like how the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have always led the church. Harlan continues expressing his dogmatic comments by informing me that there's a new YouTube interview out with Richard Bushman making these claims on Mormon stories of all places. It's titled, Top Mormon, Hist Mormon Historian Admits Issues Raised in the CS Letter. Harlan continues, truth is something beyond your opinion or mine. Facts are facts. Whether you like them or not, Marty, there was no restoration because the Book of Mormon is fiction. Only the Catholic Church is the true church of Jesus Christ. The false prophet Smith's sexual debauchery is a problem for your false church as well, Marty. The 19th century was marked by American writers who wanted to tell stories about native culture pertaining to American history. Creativity fueled this art form in interesting ways. This being true, I am convinced that all the founding documents of the LDS Church fit nicely into a religious movement that sprang from the Second Great Awakening of the early century and its zeitgeist of the culture stories of the day. Joseph Smith, despite his personal idiosyncrasies, could be considered a writer romanizing trend of the era with a religious mythology that truly exudes the American spirit. Novelty and innovation could indeed be the driving literary engines that made the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price so appealing to the public. Smith effectively fused fiction together with organized religion to create a movement truly revolutionary although a false movement. <laughs> I cannot ascribe any historical merit to the Book of Mormon, nor any ecclesiastical validity. 
I do believe it is a valuable piece of American religious fiction and should be treated with that much respect by the literary community. Just as I find value in the words of religious fiction like J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings or C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. These are English works of Christian fiction. The Book of Mormon should take its literary place in the company of American writers like James Fenimore Cooper. The Book of Mormon is a work just like these other works of fiction. Some of the Book of Mormon's material is inspirational in a human sense regarding of where it was recycled from. Harlan then begins to attack Joseph Smith as a false prophet, saying, Strengthened by the message of the good news, the apostles went forth and the Lord confirmed it, this good news, by the signs that attended it. What supernatural signs did Joseph Smith ever do? Did he walk on water? Did he raise people from the dead? Did he pick up poisonous snakes and survive? Who validated any such miracles wrought by Joseph? Well, this reminds me of the process the Catholic Church uses to confirm their saints. Joseph Smith prophesied the second coming of Christ, he says, before the end of the 19th century, so he was a false prophet. Reputable scholarship, archaeological science, confirmed history, and most of the Christian community stand opposed to the mythology created by Joseph Smith. That is a fact you are free to like or dislike, Marty, believe or disbelieve. It is the reality you face. The debunked claims of the fraud perpetrated by a 19th century criminal claiming prophet status is not going to convince anyone who is not brainwashed by the cult of Mormonism. The Book of Mormon makes extravagant claims about the Americas, which have never been confirmed by those who do legitimate <laughs> archaeological and historical research. The Book of Mormon makes claims that great cities with vast populations engaged in great and violent conflicts in this hemisphere. Confirmation or discrediting of these claims is not nearly as difficult as the task of analyzing evidence from the digs in the Middle Eastern world from prehistorical eras. Ancient people from Israel did not build a boat and cross the Atlantic Ocean. That is a myth, Harlan says, created by someone with an active imagination. If any of these claims made in the Book of Mormon about Nephites and Lamanites were true, there would be confirmed evidence to date. Ruins of such cities, mass graves of the dead, monetary coins, tools, weapons, identified locations, and much, much more. We have physical archaeological evidence as well as confirmed history that the Roman Empire did once exist. That cannot be disputed. We have many tested artifacts that affirm this fact. The things that archaeologists have not found, and I would say yet, refutes the historical authenticity of the Book of Mormon. The indigenous people of the Americas did not come from the old world of ancient Israel. The Aztecs. Incas, Mayans, and all the North American natives originated from people who lived once in Asia and not the Middle East. Harlan continues. He takes a short detour and starts railing on the evangelicals and Protestants saying, The heresy of faith alone, OSAS, once saved, always saved, is a false teaching, sola fide, and it's often taught in evangelical Christians, though not always explicitly. Martin Luther himself announced that his doctrine of justification by faith alone was a foundation of teaching upon which the church stands or falls. Luther was so far went so far as to say, even if a believing person commits adultery and murder, one thousand times per day. As long as that person continues to believe by faith, they will be saved no matter what. Modern evangelicals call this heresy. Once saved, always saves. OSAS. It means that if it, one is truly born again, saved by faith alone, there is no sin they can commit which would deprive them of eternal life. Salvation in Christ can never be lost. In other words, Calvinists merely go a step further and say that since no one has a choice in believing in the first place, they cannot lose something they never worked for. Those who are elected to salvation will be saved regardless of their choice. Those who are to be damned will be damned regardless of their choice. Wow. Sola Fida and OSAS are heresies that come straight from Martha Luther himself, though recycled over the past 500 years. Calvin tried to moderate the extreme views of Luther by teaching that only the elect will live godly lives by being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Calvin also believed that sins in themselves could never remove the elect from God's grace. A good book written by evangelical Protestant on this subject is Life in the Sun by Dr. Robert Schenck. Shank was a Southern Baptist pastor when he penned this volume that changed OSAS by demonstrating the error using scripture in a scholarly manner. Evangelicals deny that the Bible teaches a person can lose their salvation by willful sinning. 
The independent fundamental Baptist pastor Stephen Anderson said from his own pulpit, there is nothing you can do to lose your salvation if you are saved. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, has never taught OSAS. Even the people, Pope does not have such an assurance about his own salvation. The reward of continued and absolute apostasy from the faith of Christ is the loss or forfeiture of eternal life. As long as a person lives, he may repent and regain his favor with God. However, if he dies first without reconciliation with Christ, his soul will be finally lost. Within the academic circles of mainstream religion, which approach is is legitimate. In other words, which approach is legitimate? John Calvin was highly dependent upon the theological understanding when he developed his ideas in Institutes of the Christian Religion. His use of scripture was in accord with his exposition of limited texts and some statements of the church fathers, i.e. Augustine. What the biblical theologian attempts to do is properly understand all of the biblical, biblical data cohesively. Protestantism has always been plagued with theological opinions masquerading as orthodoxy. Protestants can't even agree on what orthodoxy is completely. Where so many evangelicals err is by reading a text like Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 and concluding that it declares emphatically that believers are saved by faith alone without any need for repentance, works, sacraments, or any other act of obedience. This error is called reading one's theology into the text. In actuality, St. Paul intended no such interpretation. For by grace alone you have been saved through the work of faith, and this grace through faith is not from you. It, grace through faith, is the gift of God. It is not from mosaic works of the law. So no one may boast, for we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works of love, Galatians 5, 6, that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Evangelicals like Martin Luther do not understand St. Paul's formerly rabbi Saul of Tarsus correctly. Harlan says, to them, Paul is like an earlier version of Luther who lived in the first century. Paul only taught those things that had been handed on to him by others. By tradition, in other words, he says the Seed Council of Trent. Harlan says, my degree is in biblical studies rather than theology per se. To be honest, theology is more often than not a hindrance to the study of the text of sacred scripture. Theology must follow biblical exegesis and not precede it. Evangelical Protestants, in my opinion, he says, are notorious for forcing their theology into the text rather than examining the plain meaning of the biblical data. Only the church as a whole can pronounce the meaning of scripture in an authoritative way. Individual private interpreters do not have the authority to determine the meaning of the Bible without sanction of the church. As Catholics, we refuse to answer questions like, what does this verse mean to you? We respond with, the church has told us that this verse means such and so. Catholics must submit to the infallible teaching of both scripture and tradition as defined by the magisterium. See the Council of Nicaea and scripture. Harlan's thesis is that if there was no great apostasy in the LDS understanding, then there is no Mormon church, priesthood, or prophets in reality. Simon Peter said in reply, saying, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of, Bar jo son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Next is Matthew 16, 16 through 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, teaching them to observe all that have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, Catholic Church until the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Implications of the theory of the great apostasy. One, Jesus earlier lied, either lied to the original 12 apostles or was too weak to keep his promise to them. In other words, Jesus failed to prevent the early church from being overcome by the gates of the netherworld. Fact, Jesus is no liar. He is not a weak and flawed Messiah either. Two, in the fictional work of the Book of Mormon, Jesus failed again to keep his church in the Americas from being overcome by the netherworld. The Nephites were overcome by the Lamanites. Three, so according to Mormon theology, Jesus is incapable of preserving his church from the first century and from the Americas from being prevailed against by Satan, the spiritual brother of Jesus, according to Mormonism. So it becomes obvious that in essence, this Jesus is a failure. 
If you believe that he failed to prevail against Satan's works, such that the church of Jesus established, apostatized. Question, why would any rational person believe that such a Jesus can preserve the current LDS church on earth? Satan is already two for two, and Jesus is zero for two so far. In your interpretation of these verses, it seems to me that your primary work as a representative of the LDS church, Marty, is to present complete archaeological evidence and real science that demonstrates conclusively the existence of the civilizations of the Nephi fights and Lamanites in the Americas. The DNA evidence of the Aztecs, Incas, Mayas, and North American indigenous peoples shows their origins genetically to be from Asia and not Mesopotamia or Palestine. Civilizational evidence means uncovering the same kind of evidence we have for other civilizations like that of the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Roman Empire. LDS church sources are not credible, Harlan says, and subject to prejudice. This conclusive evidence must be proven to the world at large, not just to private individuals here and there. I could go on and on with more of Harlan's correspondence with me, and I may even have done too far already, but sharing what Harlan has said to me has been helpful. But I feel uh, strongly that I need to share with you exactly what Harlan's religious apologists are hurling at the church membership and how it can be difficult for the average member of the church, which I am one such average Joe, and who isn't an academic that has biblical scholarship under their belt, which I do not have. We can be made to feel we're an idiot which I do not feel I am. I want you to know that you can still defend the church and its truth claims, even without the so-called competent biblical scholarship that apologists like Harlan holds out as a weapon of superiority. Such scholarship is not superior. And let me tell you why. I have read the works of many scholars from the world of who specialize in this field of biblical scholarship from both sides of the debate. I even took on the world-renowned atheist Richard Dawkins, who's considered to be the world's most famous um, atheist, by answering his arguments he put forth in his anti-theistist and anti-Christ book, The God Delusion, in which he openly admitted right at the beginning he can't prove God does not exist, just as I said that I can't prove he does exist. The same conclusion is true of whether or not the Book of Mormon can be true, proved to be true, and whether Joseph Smith can be proved he was a prophet, and whether or not the Church of Jesus Christ is in fact the Lord's true and living church here on the earth today. It is all a matter of interpretation and confirmed bias, for there is no irrefutable evidence to prove either side of the debate. It is my belief that when we are equipped with the simple tool of this principle that says, we believe in worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men that same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may, or not. We may control our discussions in this way. With this perspective and mindset, we can always say, we can agree to disagree, can't we? We can always say, I accept that that is your interpretation of the scriptures or of the data that's being discussed. We can always say, as you well know, Harlan, we can't perfectly reconstruct an event of history that took place just last week, let alone 200 years ago or 5,000 years ago. It is impossible. And so all we can do is give one's faith's doctrine, the interpretation of the evidence and what uh, story it says that it is taught uh, by God's living prophets. But with that said, it seems to be a fact that there's always going to be at least two very different interpretations of the same data. Even though we have 204 years of gathered data, the evidence and the interpretations that have been made, this debate has been an ongoing debate where many scholars and academics have their opinions, their interpretations, and their conclusions on what's the story they've made up or come up with, with no consensus, and that's because it's not operational science. It's historical science. Operational science can be tested and retested, and always the results are the same, no matter who does the testing, whereas historical science cannot be tested except for carbon dating, which is not absolute in its accuracy, that's for sure. This is why I simply refer to folks like Harlan to my YouTube channel and the video playlist where I have 33 categories, including the one titled Book of Mormon Evidence, and have saved hundreds of videos in most of them. There are now more than 440 videos saved in the Book of Mormon Evidence category alone. I also refer to folks to multiplicity of articles and apologetics that take on these critics' questions. One recent resource is a book just published, like I said, by Austin Five, titled Light and Truth Letter, which takes on the arguments laid out in the CES letter. 
What I'm saying here is that none of us, none of us have become a scholar or Latter-day Saint apologist. We don't have to become that like Brother Smoot is or Dr. Jared Halverson or Stephen Harper are and hundreds more are out there. We also don't need to engage in a contentious back and forth debate as a way of a defending the church. The way to defend the church that I am suggesting and in my way of thinking is in fact being the grown up in the room is to realize that all of the work has been done and is being done by academic scholars who are LDS scholars which the world doesn't accept and so we don't need to become one of those scholars and spend our entire adult life in order to defend our faith. We have the church's official website with all of its articles and essays. We have a website called Scriptural Cit Scripture Citation Index, tons of talks and comments. We have the Joseph Smith papers. We have hundreds of other apologetic websites like Jonathan Neville's website that I listed in the description to the Zoom call I did with him just recently. And we have living prophets and apostles and the gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those are our resources, our spiritual weapons that Cardinal Ellis spoke of to help us defend our truth claims. In addition to what I just listed, there are multiple spiritual smart bombs, such as the YouTube videos where the CES letter has been debunked time and time again by smart people, by individuals far brighter than me, and they are all available with a click of the mouse. But you will find that most of the people who come at you with these kinds of arguments or criticisms of the church, its leaders and its truth claims, like my friend Harlan has done to, to me, are fixed in their interpretations of the evidence and the history and the way one uh, one's is supposed to learn the truth. And so it doesn't pay to get into a contentious argument. It just doesn't pay. Simply say, I grant you your opinion, your perspective, your interpretations. That's the joy of agency. That's the same privilege you and I have. It seems to me that Harlan's faith in God to his in his disciples and asked him, who do you say that I am? I also get to the same sense about Pastor Jeff or Hello Saints. In my humble opinion, Pastor Jeff, though a good and loving man, I'm sure, is also an academically trained apologist who happens to be a pastor. Most pastors go into an academic institution to get their credentials for becoming a pastor. And so every time I listen to Pastor Jeff, he comes across to me as an academic first and not as a spiritually enlightened believer first. It seems to me that his testimony is academically based and not based on a spiritual revelatory experience or experiences as a gift from God. So. In closing, let me share another favorite quote made by the prophet Joseph Smith. I love Joseph Smith regarding this topic of defending our faith in humility and love. Here's what Joseph Smith said, and I quote, Avoid contentions and vain disputes with men of corrupt minds who do not desire to know the truth, who do not desire to know the end quote. I do not believe that Harlan or Pastor Jeff or folks like them are corrupt or have evil intent. I believe they are sincere in their intent to try and save us from our false faith. But due to their academic mindset, I do find them to be lacking in open-mindedness to additional truth. And hopefully, I've come across as someone who loves them as children of God. Hopefully, I have come across as someone who's the adult in the room where defending the church takes place. My desire to simply share my faith openly with anyone seeking to experience God's love and is open to learning of him and of his truth, I'm more than willing to carry an, a non-contentious conversation about these very important topics with anyone who is open-minded. And I will do so in love. With my channel and the videos I'm posting on it, I'm trying my very best to defend my faith in the true and living God, as well as defend the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to which I belong, and do it with strength of character and humility. But I sometimes fail at it. And so if I have offended anyone in this way, please forgive me and let me know. It's not my intent. And Harlan, if you watch this to the end, I want you to know that I still consider you a friend and look forward to many more exchanges like we've had. And I hope that you can soon be united with your family and your wife. That's it. Until next time, I wish you all continued success and God bless to all of you. Goodbye.